Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out. I'm Nick Gillespie. This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie, script consultant Nick Gillespie, executive producer Nick Gillespie, key grip Nick Gillespie. Uh, but today's guest is Brian Doherty, my longtime colleague at Reason. Uh, you're now a senior editor? Uh, yeah, that's a very right. senior, senior editor. editor. Uh, and you're the author most recently of Dirty Pictures, How an Underground Network of Nerds, Feminists, Misfits, Geniuses, Bikers, Potheads, Printers, Intellectuals, and Art School Rebels Revolutionized Art and Invented Comics. Who did you have to leave out of that subtitle? Uh, um, <clears throat> the favorite term that I pushed for and didn't end up was messiahs because there are ah. two different <laughs> characters who saw themselves as messiahs in this book, uh, Vaughn Bode, uh, yeah. who was the cartoon messiah, as the name he used in his public performances, and uh, Barbara Mendez, who used the name Willie as a cartoonist, who, who has a peculiar vision of uh, Judaism, which she explained to me at great length, where she sees herself as a, as a female messiah, which is what she believes God would do. God would not do the obvious thing and send you know, some man from a shul to be the Messiah. Did send, you, uh, another round comics artist. Did you introduce her to the good news? I mean, the Messiah has come. Yeah, no, right? she she introduced Christ me to the risen. good news. She has painted beautifully elaborate uh, versions of three books of the Bible where she sort of outlays in a sort of comics format, but a painting, every single verse of the Bible gets its own panel illustration. It's magnificent stuff. And my, my entire interview with Barbara Mendez, who was one of the most fascinating characters I met, is going to run uh, on the Comics Journal website sometime in the next few weeks. Do you have a quick and the type of mean joke that Von Baudet might appreciate if he were still alive to appreciate it about how he met his end? Yeah, uh, Von Baudet wasn't, uh, I was going to say the word early. I don't know this true. He He's the earliest case I know of, of a person prominent enough whose death is Recorded by history of autoerotic asphyxiation. Um, he, 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 he did it frequently. It's it's a, it's a funny, weird, and also kind of touching story that's told in, in decent detail in the book. Because his, his son Mark Baudet, who has carried on the tradition of his art, Mark Baudet still draws in his father's style and his father's character. Was a young boy, five or six, I think. The details are in the book. Was waiting outside, and, and I believe the detail is the last thing Vaughn did before the autoerotic asphyxiation went wrong was like slip some money under the door so his son would have have money uh, for lunch. And he, 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 he attached a certain visionary uh, patina around it. He would say, you know, I go, again, I'm, I'm, I, I might state the details a little wrong. They're in, in the book more precisely. You know, he, he, he travels to God country and, and sees God and, and uh, he did it uh, one time too many, and something went awry, and mm. and he died. Uh, Jay Lynch, uh, a very interesting uh, cartoonist and character in the book, uh, was convinced that Von Baudet faked his own death for reasons that the historical record did not make quite clear to me. But he took this seriously enough that he like had his friends investigated. He thought Vaughn had just slipped off to Canada and France for some reason. But uh, I could find no evidence this was true. I think Yvonne Baudet did indeed die well, with of that, erotic asphyxiation. With, with that as an amuse bouche, uh, tell me th what is the elevator pitch for Dirty Pictures? Yeah, um, <clears throat> comics as an art form have, have been transformed in the last 30 years into something that, you know, serious publishers regularly publish – you know, book-length comic books that are called graphic novels or graphic memoirs, that, you know, museum exhibits of comics are more common. They, they've really taken a sort of lowbrow to, to highbrow change. And, and I thought it was interesting that the key figures uh, that led to that happening were people who started in the gutter. You know, they started mm -hmm. being very deliberately grotesque, kind of taking commercial comics even to a lower place in, in kind of cultural and attitudinal terms. But by breaking the barriers of what it was acceptable to do with stories told through drawn pictures, they advertently, it was advertent, I think. I, I don't think it was advertent at the start, but it became advertent to some of them that, hey, we started maybe by drawing absurd stories about talking turds, but by realizing that we can draw and sell and get fans for stories about talking turds, I, I, we have a new sense of what you can do with comics. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the talking turd guy is specifically Art Spiegelman, one of the spines of the story and, and almost certainly the most important figure in this change. And he 
you know, the, the very same comic book that contained his, his talking turd story, you know, also contained his original three-page version of Mouse, which became kind of the linchpin of the pivot of comics from disreputable nonsense to extremely serious and important American art. And that seemed ironic and interesting, and, and uh, that I could write a whole book about it actually arose from a, a feature article I did for Reason, um, focusing on the fact that these comics actually were uh, illegal. Like, people actually were arrested mm -hmm. in the, the late 60s and early 70s for selling these comics. Uh, none of the artists ever got arrested because it's hard to find the artist, but it's easy to find, you know, the poor schmuck behind the counter of a bookstore who who sold it to an undercover cop. And and so this happened a fair amount, and, and that, that comics, you know, revolution in, in taste and cultural cachet arose from that kind of scenario. It seemed interesting to me, and, and the characters in it were super interesting, and I, I tried to let their voices, you know, carry yeah. the story. There's not a lot about, like, what I think of all of it in this, because they spoke for themselves very well and very eloquently. Yeah, let's uh, talk about, uh, I mean, Art Spiegelman, we'll get to him in a second. Let's talk about the other kind of leading figure in all of this, which who is Robert Crumb. Uh, who was Robert Crumb, and why is he so important to underground comics? And I guess now that I've asked you one question, I'll ask you five more before sure. I give you a chance to answer that. But explain what it meant. What what's the difference between an underground comic and a surface level or above ground comic? Yeah. Um, the the business and distribution models were were distinct, um, and obviously the content was also distinct. But the content could be distinct because the business models uh, were distinct. And Crumb, Crum, it, it, it can get complicated, but I'll make it less complicated. Like, I think it is fair to say, and most people say, that Crumb invented the underground comic book, the object, the pamphlet that looked like a normal comic and was 32 to 48 pages, and y you put it next to Superman, and they seem like the same thing if you didn't look too closely, you know, just in, in the shape. He invented that. He did, he did not necessarily invent... The style of drawing weird, hippie, druggy, personal stuff in, in comics form in the book gets into all this. But he invented the comic book. And he was he was a comic book kid. He was a weird, mm -hmm. nerdy, tortured child with a very strange childhood who was bullied by his big brother Charles at age nine into drawing dozens of full-length <laughs> comic books. Like he, he it was the crumb chain gang. Like his brother forced him to do it. And it, it got in him, and uh, they would do. They were early fans in the community of comics and humor fanzines across the country. Uh, the most prominent one that him and his brother did was called Foo, F O O. Um, so he was just a comics kid, and that's it was ingrained in him. It's how he understood the world, and he somehow got it in his head. And it's really interesting to see the stuff he drew in the '60s before he published the first issue of Zap Comics, Crumb's first comic uh, was called Zap. Uh, it started as a solo crumb thing, and then a team, you know, developed to do it. Um, he was drawing all this stuff in the 60s that there was no chance anyone would publish it, sort of these proto-graphic novel -y things, some of them starring his most famous character, Fritz the Cat. He was just compelled to do it. He didn't know why he was doing it. He didn't know that it could ever lead to anything. Um, it was fascinating. I mean, there's probably lots and lots of egocentric kids who you know, write letters to their friends about how they're going to completely change the art form they love. I imagine there's lots of them. That it was intriguing to come across the one who, who his letter to his friends he wrote when he was 16 or, you know, published later. And you see, he was right. He had this crazy dream that couldn't have come, couldn't come true. And, and it did. And he made it happen. And uh, he was just really great at it, you know. And, and whether, you know, the book is not really shaped by my aesthetic judgments, but it is universally acknowledged by everyone who followed that he was the greatest and he showed them the way and they understood that you could do things with, with ink on paper that they didn't believe you could do. Um, briefly, talk about fanzine culture because, you know, I, I think people in this audience, like we're all on the other side of, you know, of an era of fan culture where fanzines were a thing or you could somehow, you know, I mean, there were, there were magazines like People, uh, you know, that 
our, our kind of like fandom come become like a time life property and things like that. But what what were fanzines like in the late 50s or early 60s? Because this is, you know, set against the backdrop of like mass culture at its most massified, right? Where it's like post-war culture, everybody is a conformist. There are, you know, f- three television networks. There are, you know, five publishers. And there's very little individualism in the stuff that you buy at the store, what were fanzines doing and what did they look like then? Yeah, they, they were produced. This was most of them, and the year I'm writing about was before uh, xerography was convenient to most people. So they were reproduced by, you know, if you're sort of our age, you might remember like the Ditto machine in school yeah. and, and even more obscure technologies like the hectograph, where you would have this gelatinous mass that you would <laughs> put a, you would mush the image on and put a chemical and then if you pressed paper on the gelatinous mass it would transfer the image uh, to the paper so they were generally done in you know editions of 20 to 50 generally by smart ass weirdo kids teens who would find each other's addresses in like the letter pages of cracked magazine and uh, they would just and Crum arose from this Spiegelman arose from this he did a fanzine called Blase in 1962 um Crumbs was Foo, uh, and, and then some others. Jay Lynch, Skip Williamson, and they all corresponded. Uh, you know, I, I guess it's kind of proto internety in a sense. Uh, and luckily, Jay Lynch was a pack rat, and all of his papers ended up at Ohio State University. So I got to read dozens, probably hundreds, actually, of the letters these teenage wiseacres were sending to each other, and they would get, like, the local TV show host to mention their zine, and someone's mom knew someone at the New Republic, and they could get their zine and DC newsstands, not really. Uh, they were convinced Mad Magazine was stealing ideas from their mm-hmm. zines. Uh, just super enthusiastic weirdo kids who were very excited to find someone else who shared their passion. And I have the, in the book I, a little one of the more eloquent and poetic passages uh, that I liked a lot in my book kind of goes into this. I'm not going to be able to reproduce it off the top of my head, but I, I found myself very much falling in love with these kids and their visions. And it's especially uh, layered when you know that uh, they did it. Like they, they mm-hmm. did change. And I think what you're getting as we do live, they were kind of one of the first waves of fans of popular culture taking over popular culture. Um, you know, comics beforehand were just made by professionals, you know, not necessarily people who who loved or had a passion for the medium. This is a complicated question. I think a lot of them had a little more love for it than they would admit if you asked them. But comics were the pop genre that first saw people who were fanatical fans of it uh, take it over. And uh, it happened in superhero comics as well, but with characters like Spiegelman, Lynch, Williamson, and Crum, it was humor fans because they were – you know, we sort of think of comics as mostly a superhero thing or a manga thing. These particular kids we're talking about were fans of satire zines, Mad and the things that followed Mad. Mad mm. was was the thing that inspired all of them. Like, none of this would have happened without Mad Magazine, particularly the early Mad Magazine by Harvey Kurtzman, which sort of showed them, you know, as smart-ass alienated kids, they sort of had a sense that there's something, you know, it's like the whole Salinger thing. Like, there's something ersatz about this culture around me, the things my parents are telling Something me. very phony. Exactly. Right? Yes, um, but so, talk, say it, yes. yeah, talk about MAD because I, I want to work through in, in, in my shorthand in my notes, I have, you know, this is kind of the story of three magazines all with three words or three letters in the title, MAD to Zap to Raw. Yep. And we'll get to the latter two ones. But what was MAD Magazine? And how many people here have read MAD Magazine? How many of you grew up loving Mad Magazine, actually, or maybe even having a subscription, which was an odd thing, right? Okay, so a fair number of people. What was Mad, and why was that? Why is that so central to the experience of the people that you write about in here? Yeah, it, there was actually one specific Mad cover that various of them are like. This one cover it was a Basil Wolders, Wolverton cover. It was meant to be like a fake Life magazine of like America's most uh, beautiful girl or whatever. Yeah. It's one of, if you know Battle Wolverton's, one of his sort of slavering, grotesque, you know, spaghetti browed, weird women. Um, and, you know, kids seeing it between the age of nine and 11, you know, they're just like, it just blew a circuit in their heads. And they, it, 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 as they articulated it, like it, it, again, it showed them like they had a sense that there was something 
not on the level about adults and politics and advertising and even comic books themselves. And and Mad sort of helped, you know, rip that veil of illusion from their heads in in cartooning, especially in the early days of Harvey Kurtzman, uh, Jack Davis, Will Elder, Wallace Wood, just highly skilled and vivid cartooning. And th- that these people are all cartoonists, you know, is key. They, they thought and saw, you know, visuals meant a lot to them and th- just the the way these people reproduce reality and magnified it and mocked it and satirized it just uh, uh, turned them all into artists and it turned them all into cartoonists, which was another through line through this is in the you know late 50s, early 60s, it was when abstract expressionism ruled arts education. So all of the, a lot of these people actually tried to do an arts education thing and some of them actually got arts degrees, but they all felt completely alienated because they believed in drawing. They believed in good line work and good draftsmanship, which was completely devalued in the world of art in the time that they were getting Yeah, so educated. abstract expressionism was there, there really should be nothing on the page that was humanly rec- recognizable as human yeah, or Yeah, just all about color and represent- form, yeah. yeah. Not about draftsmanship at all. And these people all wanted to be great drafts people. And some of them were, some weren't, but... Uh, what was going draft. on in the... Fi- I mean, uh, talk about in, in like, uh, you know, uh, the, the book cover has partly uh, the comics code uh, symbol somewhere on it, uh, kind of obscured. What, what happened to comic books in the 50s that kind of degraded them as a cultural form. Yeah, yeah, that's key. Spain Rodriguez has a great riff about that uh, that I reproduce in the book. So, yeah, in Mad started his comic book in 52, and a couple of years later, a much written about, so I don't need to get into it much here, and I don't get into it that much in the book, a sort of wave of uh, anxiety about what comics were doing to kids swept the nation, and there were Senate hearings and big books about seduction of the innocent, Frederick Wortham, you all probably have heard of that, the... Uh, um, and so EC, the publisher of Mad, who also published a bunch of high-level science fiction horror comics that most of these kids loved as well, um, Mad had to become a magazine, and then Harvey Kurtzman, the guy who created it, was was squeezed out. Um, all the other EC comics just disappeared entirely. Uh, the comics code was self-imposed by the industry as sort of a way to get the cultural heat off of them. It was not explicitly a governmental act, but it was a reaction to mm-hmm. the threat of governmental acts. And, but uh, it's it's like the movie writings of the 60s, right, where it was kind of forced on Hollywood. Right, but but also like they – and, and they, they had no option because comics were thought of as for kids. Like there right. w- wasn't an option then of, yeah, we'll rate it. And so these are for kids and these are not for kids. It was just like, no, we have to rate it to say that it is for kids. And there was a whole list of things they could not do. They could not question authority, make police seem bad. Yeah. They, they couldn't forget- talk about zombies. Yeah, right? yeah. there was a lot specifically yeah. aimed at horror <laughs> comics. And, and EC people think specifically EC. Yeah. You couldn't use certain words. Because like, zombi- like the word zombie was verboten until sometime in the 70s or 80s, right? Like that's why right. there were Marvel comics that would talk about zuvembies. Yes. Because right. zombies were out. Right, yeah. And uh, and so, and Spain Rodriguez has a great little riff about how that, like, seeing, it's like he thought America stood for freedom. And then mm-hmm. through these comic books that he loved, he felt the hypocrisy of the whole system was revealed. And it made him want to be a rebel. And, like, he literally joined a motorcycle gang. He was a comic artist who was also a, 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 a biker gang guy. And, and it led him on this whole life of transgressive, you know, wild art because he was offended that the land of the free was, uh, you know, a land of hypocrisy. And he felt what happened to the comic books he loved was, uh, you know, made that seem true to him. So in a way, I mean, one of the things I loved about the book is that it, it, it fills out a kind of parallel journey in comics that you saw in literature and poetry with, say, like the Beat Movement, who were also railing against the phoniness and the prefab nature of mass culture by all kind of acting and dressing exactly the same way, but rebelliously, right? And the same thing with rock and roll and things like that. Um, talk about the ways in which the, you know, what were what was the primary act of rebellion? Because part of it is just you know, talking about things that are not supposed to be talked about in, in pleasant company, right? Oh, yeah. And, you know, I didn't, I, I got derailed a little. I, was, I started talking about the, the business model, and, and, and that's actually key to this is, you know, Crumb found just fellow hippie weirdos to print 
And the very first, uh, you know, the first guy involved in the attempt to print it was a girl named Charles, uh, Charles Plamel, who was a kind of minor figure in the beat scene as well. So there's kind of a direct lineage between comics and the beats through the man who owned the multi-lith that printed the first issue of Zap. Uh, and the idea was, we, you know, if you worked for a comic book, a normal comic book company, you just were doing work for hire. You worked for a company. Comics, uh, underground comics, did not work that way. Uh, you know, the artists drew what they wanted to drew. They found publishers and printers who were willing to print it, and they retained their copyrights, and they were paid more, in theory, they were paid on an author model of, you know, you were paid royalties based on sales, and there'd be multiple printings, whereas in the normal comic book world, you just got paid for a page, and you didn't own any of it anymore. So they, they imported largely just out of, like, a kind of hippie grooviness and crumbs willfulness, uh, uh, the the model of literary publishing uh, to the world of comics. And of course, the people publishing them, you know, the company's stories are told in, in here as well. You know, the most prominent ones are uh, Last Gasp, uh, Rip Off Press, Kitchen Sink Press. There are some smaller ones, but there's a print mint, you know, those were the dominant ones. The, the artists kind of, force is not the word, but they, they made... They found people of like minds who were willing to do business that way. Like, as, as far as I could tell, no one who wanted to get in the business of printing and distributing underground comics questioned that. It seemed like, yeah, natural, of course. You drew it, dude. It's yours. Yeah, we're, we're here to help you print and publish it. And, you know, obviously, art, there's stories of artists complaining about them not getting paid exactly as much as they should, as always happens. Uh, and then there's stories, some of which are in here, of the publisher saying the artists were a bunch of whiny bastards and they don't know what they're talking about and like they think I had some secret warehouse of comics selling out the back door you know no way but it, everyone got it's paid. actually striking compared to say like typical printing or uh, or the music industry for sure like you don't hear the same stories of getting of artists getting ripped off not wholesale you know yeah. it, like I said, a lot of the artists do think that occasionally there'd be yeah. another 10,000 printing that maybe I didn't get told right. about uh, um I think that was probably true on the margins, but mm -hmm. but for the most part, no. And in fact, like uh, uh, some of what shapes this book was shaped by you know what you had access to, like uh, Print Mint, one of the big ones. Uh, their papers do not exist anymore th that I could discover. Uh, Rip Off Presses literally blew up in 1986. They they had their warehouse above an illegal fireworks factory that literally <laughs> exploded and destroyed. Uh, There's something kind of beautiful about all of their there? records. Uh, yeah. yeah. Last Gas still exists, and I, I tried to talk them into letting me into their files, and they, they just didn't. But Kitchen Sink Press, Dennis Kitchen, who's still alive, donated his company's papers to uh, Columbia. So I got to go through them. And uh, Dennis, and I saw the record, it's true, he was so bending over backwards to keep these people mm -hmm. supported. Like, he, he would give them money that they hadn't earned yet. He's like, oh, you know, whatever, here's, you know, whatever you need. This is the page rate. If you need more tell me and you'll get it. No. And yeah, the, the publishers generally were were very nice uh, to the artists, and the artists mostly appreciated it. So let's talk about Zap specifically. And in the uh, copy of Reason that is out there, uh, there's an excerpt from Brian's book that is about Zap Comics. And I guess just as a starting point, uh, and I, I'm kind of backtracking myself, the there are multiple stories in here where people bring something to a printer and the printer just is like, this is obscene garbage, and I'm just destroying it. Yeah, there. So this is part of the world that I mean, it's hard. Even you know, whatever we're talking about in terms of censorship or repression of speech, I mean, like today, which is real and important to talk about, but like compared to back then, it's uh, an unimaginable country. Yeah, and as I alluded to earlier, people actually literally were arrested for selling these, and frequently, as Nick alludes to, uh. A printer, you know, there's there was the publisher who was the business entity, yeah. but it gets a little complicated. But most of the publishers did not own a printing press. The publishers are jobbing out the physical thing to some other company, and it was often quite a trouble to find the one who would not just say, you know, we looked at this thing that you just paid us to print, and not only you're not getting it, you're not getting your plates back. You know, screw this. This is this is obscene. So there was they found a handful of people. Uh, Shannon in the Midwest and uh, Waller in San Francisco, who they ended up relying on because they could be relied on to, to actually go ahead and, and print the thing. There was a funny one. Uh, Shannon in, in the Midwest was, was pretty cool about most of the porny comic books. But then Kitchen Sink uh, was trying to publish a feminist porny comic called Wet Satin. 
And that pushed the guy too far. He was someone who everyone agreed was normally a very First Amendment defending guy, but he found porn created by and for women. Uh, and 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 the, the I didn't talk to the guy himself, but the the sort of the the paraphrase of what the publisher remembered the printer saying is like, well, you know, the male stuff uh, that that you know that can be seen as kind of funny, but like this is he's feeling there was something about the feminine mentality that he did not want to understand that was being expressed in wet satin. So he, he, he refused to print it and kitchen had to have it printed in San Francisco. Um, so yeah, it, it, it was a difficult world to publish things that people thought of as naughty. And that's, you know, why the book has the title it does. I will tell you that uh, some of the artists in the book I've already heard from resent the title and I can understand why they might resent their great artistic group. Uh, expression being reduced to this concept, but the fact, which I've said to some of them, we'll say to more, is literally underground comics were incredibly aesthetically diverse. The level of craft was diverse. The level of intention was diverse. The level of subject matter was diverse. But literally, the one thing that is the through line true of every single character in this book is that they either drew, published, or distributed what the ta- the mores of the time considered dirty pictures, and 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 that was important. You know, I, I alluded to this earlier. The it is. It can get a little intellectually defensive, indefensible sometimes if you actually look at some of these comics, including like Zap Issue Four, the the most censored and the most arrest causing uh, underground mm-hmm. comic of all. Some you're like, what the? You know who? Why? Why would you draw this? And the New York Times asked Crumb about the story in that issue in particular, and he's just like, I don't know. I was just being a punk. You know, there there is. What there, was the story? Can you uh, paraphrase uh, yeah, it? Yeah, it embarrass it's, everyone sure. here. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's called Joe Blow, and it's uh, it, it's it's basically it's it's a an incest riff. You know, it's 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 just a bunch of drawings of 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 a family having incest in sort of punchliney way. It ends. It sort of twist to the sort of social realist parody where the parents are like seeing their kids go off and like oh our. Children are going to, you know, be the vanguard of the future mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, it did, you know, we, we, we talked about this a little. There is a lot about 60s and 70s culture that I think is difficult for people who, you know, were, grew up past it. That there was a sense, an explosive force in being able to draw and say things that everyone in the world was not telling you, telling you you couldn't draw or say. Like, if, if you kind of came of age in the 80s or 90s, there was very little that you probably felt you couldn't draw, say, or publish. I think now in the 20s, it's kind of turning around a little bit for some different reasons, which we don't get it. Like, that sense of we shouldn't say or publish certain things is coming back a little for different reasons. And so maybe someone who's 10 years old now is going to get that sense again. But... uh yeah, it, and it, it it is difficult to to get across. Like, oh no, this is really intellectually interesting. It's like, oh no, it's just you know a cock shooting cum or whatever. But like, it it that stuff meant something to you when you were told you couldn't do it. Uh, and and this kind of explains why uh, Ed Sanders, uh, the uh, poet and uh, member or founder of the Fugs, who later wrote a Charles Manson book, et cetera, but he had a journal called, or a magazine called Fuck You, a journal of the arts in the early 60s. And that's like, wow, that's kind of revolutionary. Whereas now we're people like Terry Southern to name check, like other, you know, path-breaking 60s people who just don't seem very funny anymore. Lenny Bruce is actually kind of like that. Yeah. And I I think that's true. You know, there's not a lot of, of aesthetic critique in my voice in this book, which is probably a great idea for various reasons. But yeah, I, I think it could be fair, like if someone's like, oh, let's sit down and read a bunch of underground comics from 68 to 71, and like, are they great or are they amazing? A lot of them would kind of, I think in, in, in graphic expressiveness terms, uh, they still hold up very, very well. In uh, Sometimes in storytelling terms, uh, not so well. But there, w- there was a lot of that repressed id energy coming out that that is is appealing to me and has proven appealing over the years to 
enough people that luckily, you know, Abrams thought this book should exist, and, yeah. and I'm glad they did. Um, did I get derailed from yeah, something? Was uh, well, I, uh, uh, before we go back to Zap, yeah. uh, you know, specifically as a, as a kind of publication, um, just to kind of dilate on that a little bit more. I mean, when you talk about the artistic expressiveness, it struck me, and again, I, I was kind of transposing this into other kind of forms that broke out. You know, underground comics seem like the Velvet Underground or something like where, you know, you have the Beatles doing like, you know, pretty incredible stuff and everything, but it's like, it's so shiny and it's so perky and bright and it's like parents can listen to it and little kids can listen to it and hippies like, you know, acid heads can listen to it. And then there's the Velvet Underground, which is doing something very different and dark, but meaningful and important. I mean, yeah, yeah, and the rough dirtiness, absolutely. Like, mm. yeah, I when I first encountered, you know, I am not a lifelong. I'm a lifelong aficionado of comics. I'm not a lifelong aficionado of underground comics because uh, a subway shop in Gainesville, Florida, in the mid seventies. This is I cannot verify this. <laughs> this is just a memory, but I, I have a memory, and it. it that this existed fits my understanding of the culture, so I believe my own memory. It's like 75, 76. Had like a mural in the style of like S. Clay Wilson or Robert Crumb, you know, because like underground comics were still kind of a big thing then. And I just remember finding it, it made me feel weird. You know, I didn't, oh, what is it? I don't like it, I don't like it, I don't like it. And then uh, I became a comic Because it fan. should be, it's a cartoon, it should be funny, it should be nice, right? But there's, yeah, yeah it's, yeah, it's it disturbing. Yeah, just was saying something about the world and about adulthood mm -hmm. that felt scary and unpleasant. And then, you know, I became a serious comic book nerd as a kid, and I began subscribing to the Comics Journal when I was like 11, and they would write about the undergrounds and print these images, and yeah, I just, I was scared of this stuff. I was exposed, exposed to it too early, and there's some other anecdotes of this from cartoonists in the book. Like, it, it can it can be very off-putting, and, uh, and then you dig a little deeper, and maybe if you were, you know, of... A sensible person, you'd be even more off put, but I was not more off put. I, so I became intrigued. We go from Mad Magazine in the early 50s, which is, um, you know, satirizing and parody parodying, uh, you know, advertising and Broadway musicals and big, uh, big movies and stuff like that, the way the news gets taught, et cetera. Um, Zap is created by Robert Crumb, the first kind of underground comic book, not the first underground comic. Uh, talk a little bit about Zap and why that's so important. Sure. Uh, Zap, again, is just widely recognized as the best. And it was the best, and it was the first. And then it was great because it was Crumb. And then Crumb slowly over the years allowed uh, six other artists to join. And there's a lot of great controversy that I find interesting told in the book about whether they should make it open to all underground cartoonists, which Crumb wanted to do. But Crumb... Uh, I told you he was bullied by his brother. Crumb kind of all through his life has allowed himself to be bullied by the people around him. And he allowed his partners in Zap to bully him into not letting anyone else in. But I'll, I'll read the names of them to you. And if you know this stuff, you'll see, oh, yeah, okay, I see why Zap would be the greatest. Because it was Crumb and S. Clay Wilson and Rick Griffin, who uh, came from the psychedelic poster scene. Victor Moscoso, also from the psychedelic poster scene. Uh, Spain Rodriguez, Gilbert Shelton, who invented uh, the Fabius Furry Freak Brothers and Wonder Warthog. And Robert Williams. Uh, Robert Williams is one of the great success stories of comics. He is the one who has moved on to the most prominent career in, in, in gallery art. He became a painter and sort of the founder and leader of what's called the lowbrow art movement. Um, a great success story. So these guys, they were just all great. You know, as a, there's a great quote from Crum in here when he was fighting with his zap partners later and, and sort of trying, Crum was constantly trying to escape. He just wanted to quit. You know, he, Crum, he's an interesting character. He's constantly letting other people tell him what to do and feeling like he wants to escape. And and he was complaining and bitching about his partners in Zap, but he said, you know, I got to admit, every issue is a fucking masterpiece of graphic wizardry. Mm -hmm. And that's what it was. I mean, they were. I mean, these guys, you know, look them up if you don't know their work. Like, especially Moscoso and, and Griffin and Williams as well. I'd say the ones you just like, they, they can do things with ink on paper. That's just extraordinary to look at, and uh, and uh, there was a great mix too. You know, William sort of explained it to me pretty well when I interviewed him. He's like, Zap was a mix of everything comics could do. Like uh, Moscoso and Griffin were more on just the like. There wasn't really stories you could follow. You know, though, if you were high, you maybe thought there were. It was just 
lines and ink flowing and forming things. And it wasn't abstract in an abstract expression sense, but it, it didn't feel like storytelling. It just felt like, whoo. And then Crumb and Shelton were more about storytelling and Wilson and Rodriguez kind of, you know, balanced on the edge of it. So it had the storytelling aspect, the graphic wildness aspect, just seven guys who are all incredibly good at it. And, and you know, they they kept at it, you know, until – 2016 i think mm. the last issue uh, came out and yeah they, they just did it really well and again that's that's not my judgment yeah. it is my judgment as well but it's sort of the judgment of history and the judgment of the market like zap sold enormously better than any other comic which is why the issue of should we let other artists in it became important because if you right. let another artist in it that other artist is going to do better than they could not being right. in zap and Crumb was forced to, you know, not let his other friends in. And Speaking of mad. Crumb, you know, and I, I suspect a lot of people know him from the documentary that was made about him, which is what, like almost is 20 years old now? Or uh, 95, I'm pretty sure. Wow. Yeah. yeah, time flies, right? Um, but, um, you know, how important was it that he started telling individual stories or kind of obsessing about himself, like his work became confessional, if not exhibitionist. How, wh yeah, how did he, how did that play out in underground comics? Yeah, it, it. I think it's one of the key moves towards uh, towards comics literary respectability. Now, I mean, a ton of like the well published, respectably published comics now, or or what you'd call graphic memoir, uh, autobiographical stories. Crumb did not in, invent that. Uh, a guy named Justin Green, who unfortunately mm -hmm. died between me finishing the book and the book coming out. A brilliant, wonderful cartoonist. Uh, he invented the autobiographical comic, and he's kind of the secret hero of the book, I think, and someone who I, I hope people learn about and turn to. So Green inspired both Spiegelman and Crumb and Crumb's wife, Eileen Kaminsky Crumb, mm -hmm. to start doing autobiographical work. And I, I that was – I mean, Mouse obviously just being Mouse mm -hmm. was what it was, but just the whole idea that, oh, yeah, we, it's not just – you know, stories of talking ducks or stories of guys in tights fighting each other. Like comics can be as real and human as anything else. And and Crum not inventing it, but doing it very well. You know, I think was was vital to how comics are seen. Do as you do real you think literature now? There was anything in Crum's particular obsessions because he was obsessed with sex. He was, uh, you know, to put it kind of uh, nicely. I mean, he was had strange racial views that he was not afraid to put out there i mean how much his specific manias or obsessions was that important as yeah, much it, as just being personal yeah it, it's key to both why the people who love him love him as much as they do it's key to why some of people were arrested for selling the comics it's key to why there is a lot of a new generation of cartoonists who whether or not they recognize his graphic ability don't like him and don't really want him to be uh, well remembered is uh, his own defense of it and you know as I told you earlier sometimes he would just say oh, I was just being a punk but as he's gotten older and as he's become this guy whose whole life is kind of explaining himself he's had to explain himself and what he said to me and you know I'm paraphrasing but it, it's in the book in the last chapter he's like I am and you can believe this or not but he believes it he's like I am the 20th century man who you know has no secrets like I everything is out there on the page it's just whatever was in my mind and I had the racism of America in my mind, and I had the sexism of the like repressed ectomorph incel type who feels that women have this thing he desperately needs and he can't have. Like that, that's his perspective on his attitude toward women. Uh, many women don't share, it, and that story is told in this book as well. The you know, Trina Robbins, a uh, great pioneering female cartoonist, has had a sort of lifelong sort of war with Crumb over this. She recognized something toxic in 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 the way crumb wrote and drew about women and something and and she recognized crumb was actually kind of a genius but crumb influenced lots of people who were not at all geniuses to sort right. of do the same thing well, worse like, and dumber so yeah so yeah. crumb's just like it's just in me and now it's out of me and it's on the page and it's all there and yeah and I mean, this is a, again, it, it kind of reminded me of when you think about rock music or, you know, uh, certainly like beat literature, or that kind of literature, which is when you look back on it now, it is hard to escape the overwhelming sexism and oftentimes kind of primitivism or, you know, uh, obsession, white obsession with blackness as genuine and authentic or like living a deeper life. 
Um, you know, and but there is that paradox. And if you could talk about it a little bit more with Trina Robbins and some of the other people who are inspired by what Crumb is doing, but they dislike the content, yeah. um, that seems to have played out in literature and music and other forms of popular expression. Yeah, you know, that article I wrote for a reason about it in the start was kind of centered on that, and I've alluded mm -hmm. to it. There is definitely a lot of backlash about the content of the stuff. Yeah. It was undoubtedly not. You know, it, 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 it was violating the mores of its day in one way, and now it's kind of violating the mores of the 20s in, in, in the 2020s in, in a different way. Like, yeah, there's definitely lots of imagery uh, from early underground comics that super racist and may or may not have been seen as super racist then. But I think even a lot of it even then would have been. And they were doing it. If you asked them why they were doing it, they would say, you know, it's comedy. You know, that mm -hmm. was a thing. You, you know, you drew – black people looking a certain way and that was you know they mm -hmm. thought it was funny some of them have apologized it for later some of them have not uh, the sexism stuff definitely mm -hmm. and there there was a debate and pushback within the community at the time more about the feminine stuff than the race stuff right. i'd say this was this was 80 percent like a nerdy white dude culture that's for sure and i know that's of less interest to a lot of people for various reasons right. nowadays, but you know it it, it existed. Uh, there was one uh, you know black comics pioneer uh, whose story is told at some length in in his book in his own words, a guy named Larry Fuller, who uh, you know chose as his sort of mode of expression super porny, you know, parodically super porny stuff, including one of the first. Uh, uh, gay-oriented comics called Gay Heartthrobs. Uh, there was a kind of more serious gay comic, which is talked about at length in the book called Gay Comics. Uh, but one pr prior to that was a kind of more absurd and silly one called Gay Heartthrobs. And yeah, you know, you know, a lot of a lot of these people just thought, well, we're being absurd and silly, and mm -hmm. it's it's excessive and and it's attractive because it's excessive. Like people that you know, there, there's a great Spiegelman quote in here about just sort of the mentality of like. The teenage boy in the back of the schoolroom, like mm -hmm. drawing things, you know, that if the teacher saw them would appall them. And that's that's definitely a line that runs right. through all of this. It runs through the white kids, it runs through the the black guy, <laughs> kind of the one black guy. Um, you know, it, it runs through a lot of the women too. Yeah. It's like that's was kind of the er thing, that that urge to really to transgress. Yeah, yeah to yeah. to to, to shock like people, people so, like to do it to uh talk a little bit about uh following up on uh, trina robbins and some of the women uh there was women's comics uh in 1972 and you quote uh one comics writer a, a woman saying uh, she showed them to me and i went ah this was like mad gone wild um what was the content of the women's comics uh you know and and how did that what what was the dialogue with the you know kind of mainstream male underground comics? Yeah, it was women's comics arose out of it's seventy two. The first issue came out, and simultaneously, these two women in L.A. were also making an all women's underground comic, which they called kind of more undergroundly tits and clits, and it actually went to came out like two weeks before women's comics, but they didn't know about it. Women's comics arose out of the kind of feminist consciousness raising scene of the early 70s. It was deliberately a collective. They had a lot of meetings. They talked about their feelings. Uh, they all had to come to consensus about everything that got printed, which led to certain bad feelings uh, as, as certain things got squashed by uh, the sisterhood. Uh, Eileen Kaminsky, who later married Crumb, has some very sour things to say about the the atmosphere of the feminist collective, but most of the women involved in it felt it was very sustaining, and they made a deliberate choice. And then Lee Mars, uh, one of them, talks about it in the book. It's like we wanted about half of every issue to be uh, artists who had never drawn before. They wanted to be a place where women who probably felt, for good reason, that there's no place for my comics to be printed, like. Come here, sister. Yeah, we'll we'll publish your comics. And but as Lee Mar said, like that guaranteed, and we knew it when we made that choice, that it's not necessarily going to be the greatest, right? Because we're going out of our way to be welcoming and to let people who were not professional level yet uh, publish. Uh, but it was it was it, it was mostly very personal. You know, Lee Mars had a great story in the first issue of just 
showing a woman in 1972, you know, at work and the sexism she faced at work and the sexism she faced in our relationship. You know, it was very, most of it was very feminist in that sense. Some of it had a kind of more, Trina Robbins had kind of a more airy feminine sensibility. You know, she liked drawing adventures of jungle girls and, you know, there was some more mystical stuff. Some of it was more, you know, flowery and and dreamy. And she ended up, I mean, she was both inspired by, but then ended up, drawing uh wonder woman so, yeah yeah she know. she actually broke into mainstream comics in a way that kind of almost none of the other of them did and yeah. what helped her do that she 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 was a very self-conscious feminist and so she became very interested in the history of women's comics and trina's is is, is kind of, there's a little bit of sadness to her story it's told very well in the book she she sort of felt psychologically squozen out squeezed uh, mm. out of drawing comics because of various little conflicts that are detailed in the book. Uh, but she sort of transmogrified herself into a historian of female work in comics. And she's done tons of, of great work and the, the leading work of, you know, celebrating and excavating and explaining the, the role of women creators in comics. And that led to her being able to do Wonder Woman for DC for a while. And yeah, she's, it's, she, her story is both inspiring and, and, and a little yeah. sad, but She's but it, it's also the, I mean, one of the things that uh, this also reminded me of, and you hear this a lot if you read about 60s communes that were radical and we're going to redraw all of society, and that still meant that the women did the dishes, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, and they sewed all the clothes and they did this. Like, you know, when, when you look at rock bands and when you look at literary circles and when you look at underground comics artists. Yeah, right, thank it's you. It's all I, like, I, yeah. I, that I should have fit when that When you in look the at the like, red brigades, I mean, right. even in the weather underground, like the girls were cleaning up. Yeah, like know. the reason why in 1972 yeah. this collective of women felt we needed to create women's comics, a comic book only for women, is that most – Trina is very eloquent on this. Like we didn't feel we were that welcome in the comics that the men were putting together. Like most underground comics were anthologies. Like some of them were all written in drama, the same person, but most of them were anthologies and you kind of had to be in with the editor and, you know, they would invite the people they knew to contribute pages. And Trina felt that her and other women just were not being invited. They had to create their own space. Um, and they did. So yeah, the very existence of women's comics arose from that sort of casual sexism. Of course, most of these guys yeah. saw themselves as groovy guys and yeah. revolutionaries or whatever, but as you hint, that that did not quite rise to the level of feminist consciousness for the men. But it is kind of great, too, just, I mean, everybody was creating their own space, right? Yeah. I mean, and that's, it's, it's amazing as we think about, especially if you're interested in punk or a kind of DIY culture that really came online towards the end of the 70s and in the 80s and 90s. Like, you see that all here, where it's like, uh, you know, the, the the powers that be are not going to hold space for us, so fuck it, we're going to create our own. Yeah, it was it, it was not quite DIY, DIY in the punk sense in that the artists did use the services of publishers and distributors. Um, and later in the 70s, as I talked about a little bit, the mini comics movement arose out of underground comics, which took it that next step. It's like, well, now xerography is cheap, and now you know we have the friend who works at the Xerox yeah. place, and we can just stand there all night and print them. And it's like, so we are doing something that we're the only people who touched it, and that's the real underground comics. But um, the actual underground comics whose story is told in here, like they, the artist drew them, and they owned them, and they got royalties, but they did mostly job out the printing and distribution to other people. There are a few instances, which I talk about in the book, where an artist, did, they go, well, I know I know where they get the covers printed, and I know they're printing the insides at, uh, at Waller. I can just do this myself. And occasionally an artist would do it, and then they just feel like, eh, you know, whatever. I, You know, Kim Deitch talks about, Kim Deitch talks about, you know, he self-published his Corn fed comics, and it's like, yeah, I still have a thousand of them. You know, it's like, I, yeah. I, I who, who needs Well, they it, you know? discovered the division of labor pretty quickly, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so let's talk about Raw and, and Art Spiegelman. So we go from Mad to Zap to Raw. What was Raw and why is Raw important? Yeah, so uh, Spiegelman was always kind of the intellectual of the movement, despite drawing stories about 
talking turds and, and, and all that. Uh, and he, he, It's kind of a hell of a movement when you're <laughs> yeah, the intellectual yeah. because you draw talking turds. And he was. And, and he and, uh, and his good friend Bill Griffith, who is still successful to this day with the Zippy the Pinhead comic strip syndicated in newspapers across the country, they're like, we're going we're gonna to elevate this stuff. Like, we, we want to get out. We don't just want to be, you know, eye candy for trippers. We don't just want to be drug humor. We don't want to just be sex humor. Like, Comics really can be adult, and they created a magazine format underground called Arcade in the mid '70s, when the the, biz, the initial flush of the business success of underground comics was kind of fading. By then, for reasons told at length in the book, so so they got Print Mint, who was init, you know the sort of first king of uh, comics. They were the initial publishers of Zap. They talked Print Mint, and oh, we're going to do a serious magazine on really good paper, and we're going to get it next to National Lampoon on the newsstands. And it, it kind of killed Print Mint, because it didn't work. Um, they, they printed seven issues that are great, and people still love them. And to this day, I'll talk to cartoonists who you know were, did not live when they existed. We think that Arcade was it. Arcade was the greatest comic publication that ever lived. Uh, so Spiegelman left San Francisco, moved back to New York, uh, married his current wife, uh, Francois Mouly, who is art director of The New Yorker now. Um, and he he felt burned out by the arcade experience, and he never wanted to be an editor again. But Francois actually owned a, a printing press and, and had an interest in comics, uh, sort of that knowing Art Spiegelman uh, fed, and she kind of... Art almost puts it like he got fooled into it in a way. He thought they were just going to do one, one issue of Rise. Like, oh, I knew it was going to become a periodical. I wouldn't have gotten involved. But uh, he he was trying to take the concept of intellectually serious graphic comics and, and break it away from his old coterie. Like this is a very coterie-driven story. These people all knew each other. They lived with each other. They dated each other. Like the the greatest of them will have a story to tell about the least of them. You know, they were a real team. And Spiegelman kind of wanted to break out of that. Uh, and, you know, there was only one other like actual old school underground comic guy in the first issue of Raw. Um, he, he wanted to pivot to find a new generation of artists who could do serious intellectually interesting art and the the influence that really made raw different from the undergrounds was the euro influence that uh francois mouly brought in uh there was a lot of that you know in raw and and it worked like they discovered people like uh, suko and gary panter and charles burns and they really did incubate the next generation and and obviously uh, mouse was serialized in raw i guess that's the most important thing that arose out of raw was mouse uh, you know they laid the look and feel of you know serious uh comics from then on and and, and it in a way it was an intentional pivot personally for spiegelman he felt it was a pivot but like you look at him like well this is and you look at arcade and you go yeah this is you are kind of doing you're doing underground comics w without your old friends and but that's what this is i think he he and and Muli might reject that interpretation uh, but i uh, i think it's a fair way to look at it it's do you like, is it you know is it kind of a and again i hate to keep dragging it back to this but what the hell um you know kind of in the way that a group <clears throat> or rather uh, something like rock music you know variously defined Ten years after, you know, 1955 or 1958, say, you know, suddenly you start getting artistic. Um, underground comics, after about a decade, you know, they had a great run from the late 60s to the late 70s. And then suddenly it becomes an art form that is much more varied and much more serious and just much more sophisticated, really, for lack of a better term. Yeah, and a lot of, you know, a lot of the first wave of cartoonists rejected that. Right. Like, there was a lot of... There's a lot of envy, Jerry Lee Lewis's yeah, out there, right? Envy and contempt and like, what the hell is this artsy yeah. fartsy bullshit? Like, I came are, here to draw talking turds, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, comics are meant to be subversive nonsense, right. uh, printed on really yeah. bad paper and read on the toilet. Like, there, yeah. that mentality is in a lot of the actual artists, right. and uh, and uh, you know, Spiegelman's an interesting case to have arose out of a coterie and like really risen and yeah. become a thing so much greater than any of them could imagine mm -hmm. any of them could have been. And, and it, there, a, a lot of weird emotions arise from that. And, and, you know, you'll talk to, I, I didn't end up using this, but there's one old associate of his, who's just like mouse. Oh, I can't believe that fucking piece of crap. Won a Pulitzer. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. And, and, and I, I, to me, I, 
what I came to think I understood, you know, journalistically is like you just remember your buddy Artie from 1971 right. and like you can't. It's like his mouse is not a piece of crap. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> of this, not, yeah, but, but this is you know. like the rest of the Beach Boys after Smile saying Brian or after Pet Sounds like Brian, you know, go back to writing songs about cars and girls. Yeah, yeah, and, right? and the people who had that mentality weren't doing much publishable work past 1978. Like, yeah. like their particular nonsense did get kind of squeezed out of the market, and and sort of the pivot to what would now be known as like alternative comics, right? It's like we don't we don't call non superhero, non manga comics undergrounds anymore. Like we kind of call them alternative comics. Right. And, and the, the difference is I, I tease out the distinctions a little bit. The, the answer I came to, which I think is a pretty solid answer, though I think some of the underground people might reject it, is a, a certain literary sensibility that most of the 60s, 70s undergrounds did not have got injected into alternative comics, I'd say largely by the Hernandez brothers, uh, Gilbert and uh, Jaime Hernandez, like a sort of quality of literary fiction that however great and, and interesting love 60s. love rockets. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. In their, it's a little hard to describe them because they were not collaborators and they didn't work together, but they drew comics that got published together in a periodic mm -hmm. with the same name. So it's complicated. But the work of the Hernandez brothers, uh, you know, th there was not many stories in first wave underground comics that like arose to the level of literary short fiction. And then the Hernandez brothers started doing that. And then people like Chris mm -hmm. Ware and Daniel Klaus and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Alison Bechdel and, and others mm -hmm. who all are rooted in the undergrounds in a way. Mm -hmm. I, I make what I think a, a, a defensible case that like every – great interesting comic that arose you know from 1980 on absolutely can be traced back to this subversive nonsense but it was different it was rooted in it but it was different in 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 uh, in in a way that is interesting and and i think it's fair to call it maturation i mean yeah. there there are characters in this book who don't think so, and they're still like, no, it's not funny, it's not, blah, it's not, you know, but it it's is, not, there's it no flop sweat, you know. But It uh, is kind of like when you're listening to, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis or Little Richard, like, there's no way you're going to see Genesis or Yes in that, but it, absolutely it comes out of, you know, something that was only 10 years before, really. Yeah, exactly, and yeah, and in, in musicals, yeah, there's this pulsing energy yeah. to that crazy shit from, you know, yeah. the 1971 issue of amputee love or whatever <laughs> that you know that raw didn't have and yeah but yeah. you know um we're going to open it up for questions in a second i want to ask you before we go to that though can you just you know you you have written what is this your fifth book okay yes so and you know you start with this is burning man uh you have a, a, a radicals for capitalism which is a history of the modern libertarian movement you did a book about ron paul's revolution a book about gun laws um what is, is there a through line to your oeuvre because i think a lot of people looking at this you know from from a distance might be what the fuck is wrong with this guy or yeah like uh, kind of you know. it's you can't answer this question without sounding like a pretentious jerk but i'll, I'll go ahead and please dare to be that jerk. like yeah there's um an something that is or is perceived of as outsidery but energetic you know mm -hmm. burning man and i i however much any of you in to care about burning man i wrote about oh god i sound like an idiot i wrote about burning man long before a book about burning man long before it probably made sense to write a book about burning man and especially as i see what happened to burning man since then um i had an eye this this is a little different because this is about something that's over in a sense um i had an eye for things that were culturally edgy undergroundy either artistically or politically and that just stuff seemed interesting to me. And then, you know, if you're in the market to sell books, you 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 need to look for things that have not been written about a ton. So, like, the market almost dictates that you have to look for things that are kind of a little bit on the edge of what everyone understands about why it's interesting. And and then I, I find the, the, the personalities who build things are very interesting. Like, the people mm -hmm. who are going to start a thing like Burning Man, like, be a libertarian in the 50s and 60s, like, do weird comics of a nature that no one thought you could do comics. Like, these people tend to be colorful, 
energetic, ridiculous people and contemplating them and talking to them and reading their mail, uh, you know, uh, is, uh, is, is fun. And, uh, Do you uh, think uh, Ron Paul, an obstetrician, would he like tits and clits? <laughs> No, you know, Ron, you know, of course, was going, I don't know, but, you know, he would say they should, you know, you sure should be free to to publish it and That's sell right. it. And, and, and do the, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. There's a, a funny little anecdote about tits and clits. Like, um, after the first issue came out, uh, Joyce Farmer and Lynn Shevely, who created it, were at a com- underground comics convention in Berkeley, and they get interviewed by Time Magazine, and they're very excited. because like, oh, gosh, we're going to we're gonna really break big. We're going to get in Time Magazine. And then... The author, the reporter's like, you, you're very interesting. You gave us a lot of great stuff, but we cannot print the title of your comic book <laughs> in Time Magazine. And so the, the the comic that would have been Tits and Clits number two, they kind of, and the fun Joyce, you know, who was still alive, wonderfully, I talked to, was like, yeah, you know, like she admits, oh, we kind of sold out. We just called it Pandora's Box, you know, <laughs> kind of a lame title. And it didn't do anyone. Well. And then they're like, screw that. And then they published like eight more issues of Tits and Clits. Uh, from then on. But yeah, yeah, I mean, that's like they couldn't get press because of what they chose to call their comic. I'll uh, tell you, uh, Brian and I both uh, years ago read for Suck.com, which was an early uh, uh, satire site on the on the web. And I had a piece that was based on something I read for Suck run in the New York Times, and they refused to run. Uh, they claimed that they would not credit it as coming from Suck.com because of the name. And that yeah. was in like 1999. Wow. So. You know, which seems like yesterday. But uh, let's open it up for questions. Malik will have a microphone, and can you? Uh, Hi, Nick. Okay, there you are, Malik. Uh, why don't you? Uh, op- uh, the man right next to you, with his hand up. Um, I gotta ask, what do you think of um, Ralph Bakshi's rendition of Fritz the Cat versus the oh. vision that uh, Ark from originally had for the character? I'll just sort of tell you crumbs because I, I, my own personal opinion is not worth. Crumb was. You know, super unhappy with the movie, and he, you know, I, there's a theme in 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 Crumb's life and stories I alluded to earlier of sort of being bullied into things. And as he tells us, like, I didn't ever want that movie to exist, and like he just kept bothering me, and I felt bad. And and then he's like, and I never agreed to it. Like he got my wife and lawyer to agree to it, and yeah. So and I thought, oh poor guy, you know, whatever. But he 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 hated it. Um, he Crumb tells a story. I think Crumb told that. Anyway, the story's in the book. Who, whoever told it will be clear in the book about he brought some of his Zap buddies to see a rough cut of it, and they all just, like, stalked out silently. Like, yeah, ev- everyone in the underground comics community sort of hated and resented that movie. And then Crumb resented that people thought he made a ton off of it. He's like, I hardly made anything off of it. You know, randomly I'd get a check here and there, I think. He sold the rights for, like, ten grand or something, and then I never saw the money. So, uh, yeah, that was... He has been especially sensitive for most of his career about like total control and not selling out. He did let Viking print a book of his art in 68 and he got really mad because they covered a vagina with a band aid and he wrote this really crazy angry letter that's quoted in the book about it. And then he let Ballantyne do a Fritz book and then for like 30 years he never did business with a major publisher. And then after the Fritz experience, he mostly has avoided, you know whatever what's the word like you know licensing out his creations for other people to do things uh next question malik hi you mentioned the uh addressing of the racism and sexism and crumb and other underground artists and you happen to have brought up bill griffiths and how does he get away with drawing a pinhead Every week or every day. I mean, is that? And this is a serious question. Yeah, no, I thought I, about this. How do, how does does he address that? Uh, no, he definitely doesn't. I, I'm I'm going to kind of spitball an answer here. It's not an issue I thought about in the book. Um, somehow, y- you know, what minorities arise to a level of cultural attention and respect? Like, it doesn't all happen at once. Like, it it it's slow and it. I guess what I'm trying to say is that day may be ahead. That day just hasn't arisen yet because, yeah, because I guess no one, there's not sufficient cultural force for respect for people who suffer from microencephaly that that has become an issue. And maybe it will. You know, Griffith is is pretty old. He's still doing it and he still loves doing it. I, I, I'm sure he wouldn't like 
to be, you know, canceled from drawing Zippy. But yeah, I guess it's just because no one, n- no cultural force has happened to arise to push back against it. And I can tell you, as far as I know, like no one, no one has raised the question that you raise. Uh, I, he told no stories about it. I've encountered no stories about it. I think a lot of people probably don't understand that it is a representation of an actual malady that some people have. I think some people might just think, oh, it's this weird cartoon character who's, who's a pinhead that, that might be part of it. And as Bill, Bill says, like he, he actually did, he has met people with microencephaly and it informed the character a little bit, but, but, but he's like, you can't, you can't actually represent how, and I'm going to use the word pinhead because it's to be the pinhead, how an actual pinhead uh, talks like it's it's too intense and it's too strange. It's like even more intense and strange than the character Zippy. That's a very interesting question, and I did totally spitball that answer, but I think it's mostly probably correct. Uh, next question. Wait for Malik. Uh, you were talking a bit about the sort of dichotomy of how Spiegelman saw underground comics and how the sort of it ain't art crowd saw comics. And you quoted Spiegelman in the book going a lot more extreme than sort of what you just represented. He said, underground comics is work that will wake you up, allows you to be able to see more, to become more receptive, more alive. That's pretty extreme exclusion of most of the stuff that I think you would call underground comics. What would he call all that other stuff prior to 1978? He knows that's what it all is. What, pardon me, I have to cough. Um, what he was saying, and I remember that quote, is like, that's what it meant to him. He was aware that there was a lot of other stuff that his friends and associates and colleagues were doing that were called and were underground comics that did not rise to that level. But he's like, that's that's what it should aspire to be. That's what it ought to be. Um, he, I think I quote him toward the end of the book. He and Crumb both kind of had similar statements like, yeah, looking back on this stuff decades later, it's like it wasn't all as great as maybe we thought it was. Even the ones who didn't think it was that great to begin with, like they think it's even less great now that there was a lot of just the energy of the transgression and that you know, graphics that look like this, graphics that don't look like something a Dell comic would have printed or a Marvel comic would have printed just are exciting and they're exciting at the time and maybe they're less exciting later. Um, So I think he would just say that other stuff are bad underground comics and he would admit that he drew a lot of bad underground comics pages as well. You can tell what they are, are the ones that he has never allowed to be reprinted in, you know, a book with the name Art Spiegelman on it. What um, was his uh, pseudonym? Uh, Skeeter Grant was one of them. Uh, Paul Cutrate, I think, was one once. Yeah, he Very did a clever. story for Bizarre Sex, and which was a Kitchen Sink publication. And some correspondence I found in Kitchen's papers where Kitchen was, you know, selling the rights to reprint some Bizarre Sex stuff in Europe. And and Spiegelman asked, and he respected, because Spiegelman owned the copyright, like, don't don't let them print the Paul Cut rate stuff. Like, I just don't want that stuff to ever be seen again. So I, did that address your question? Um, we've got time for one more question. Okay. Wait for the uh, microphone, please. Well, I apologize for my ignorance, but um, when I was growing up, my mother loved this comic, Kathy. And when you were saying earlier, Brian, that, uh, you know, the women were writing comics about work and things and people didn't want to read about them. In the 80s, there was this comic, Kathy, that my mother was in love with. How did, how did Kathy come about from, from these, you know, from the earlier sort of transgressive women in work sort of comics? I'm going to skip it ball a bit because I, I, I know Kathy. You know, I mean, I know the strip Kathy. Um, and I'm aware of Kathy Goose White, who draws it, but I am not a scholar expert in, in Ms. Goose White, and I may even be pronouncing her name wrong. Uh, the Kathy who drew Kathy. Um, but you just, and I haven't thought about this at all, but the instant you said that and I started seeing Kathy, I'm like, yeah, Kathy looks like something that would have been in the first two issues of women's comics. Like, mm-hmm. And uh, I 
don't, you know, it's funny. Cultural influence is always weird and, and authors with axes to grind can make declarations. Like I do not know, uh, you know, to get to the bottom of this, I'd have to find the editor at her syndicate who opened that envelope and was like, yeah, we're going to put this in newspapers across the country. Cause like Kathy is really badly drawn in a conventional sense of the strip. And it really was a pioneer in crummy graphics in the pages of a newspaper. And um, I would not be surprised to find that the editor who chose that had some familiarity with underground mm-hmm. comics. Cause like, yeah, that Kathy looks like the kind of stuff, you know, I mentioned Lee Mar saying, yeah, we, we decided to print amateurs in every issue and that was inevitably going to make it not as great as it could have been. Uh, yeah, that's, that feels right to me, but I don't know that it's true. But yeah, Kathy, you, you are right on to think of Kathy and think, oh yeah, that sounds like what you're talking about, about these weird personal, you know, women in work, not super professional looking stuff. Yeah, Kathy is, is a great example of that. But whether there was a direct line of influence, I, I'm ignorant about that question. And I wish I thought of it because it would have made a good couple of sentences in the book if I could have confirmed that it was true. But I don't know. Um, I guess uh, uh, just for a closing thought, uh, Brian, you know, you you talk about how in the book, I guess it's kind of the decade from '68 to '78, which was kind of the high tide of underground comics, um, and they're gone now for a lot of different reasons, including the way that publishing and distribution is done. Uh, the the need for it isn't quite the same because people can produce and circulate and distribute their own stuff. But can you talk about the you know, the culture that they were pushing back on, you know, and, and again, this starts in post-war America where, you know, there's kind of the culture, the establishment, you know, whether it's the Eisenhower, you know, the grayness of the Eisenhower years that bleed into the 60s. Is it partly, you know, the idea that there's an establishment or a single culture has just, you know, it's it's been destroyed? And, and partly, I mean, underground comics go away because they were actually really successful in just beating the hell out of the mainstream. Yeah, there's an interesting, uh, these type of cartoonists began in the mid to late 70s to find professional paying work outside the world of underground comics in magazines like Heavy Metal and sometimes National Lampoon. I talk about that a bit. Not as much as you might think, but but sometimes. And uh, a bunch of sort of low-rent, crummy Playboy imitators like, and, uh, you know, I quote Dennis Kish in the book saying, like, yeah, I almost feel like, you know, we did this because we had to do it. Like, there was no other way we could do the comics we wanted or see the comics we wanted but start our own little publishing companies. And he's like, yeah, I almost feel like, you know, why keep doing it? And he's like, and he did keep doing it for a while. And then he stopped doing it in a really kind of crazy story that's in the last chapter of the book when he, he sold half of his company to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle guys and a bunch of bad things uh, happened. Um, uh, yeah, so the felt need to do this thing because you can't do it mm. goes away when you know you can do it in other places. And some people just get older and and you know the particular style of how they did things mm. definitely feels passe now. But as you know, the the sort of through line in the story is it it just exploded the possibilities of telling story. You know, cartooning. Mm. Use the word cartooning, and uh, and I don't, I don't know how to end that sentence. Like, yeah, the the things you're pushing against are different. Like you, the 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 drug humor or the sex humor, like starts to feel less vital to everyone. It's like, well, we've kind of done it. Part of, now that part of why you did it is we're doing it more done. drugs, but having less sex. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, it all works out. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. There, there's kind of an energy to doing things because it hasn't been done that once it has been done, uh, mm-hmm. kind of goes away. And then the next thing that hasn't been done is like what the Hernandez brothers did, like tell these like incredibly touching, complicated stories of human beings. And then that hasn't been done. And then, Whatever the next thing that isn't being done, I probably don't even know about it. You know, it's being done on the internet by cartoon. You know, they're, like everything in the world, we, we live in a world of such abundance that, like, and the, the book sadly doesn't really reflect it because I never, I didn't feel I could learn enough about it to to write about it. But like, there's definitely still, I I wouldn't even be surprised to find there's more people doing comics that just look just like a 1971 mm-hmm. underground. Than there were in 1971, but they're not being printed. Mm. You know, you'll just find it on their Instagram pages. And like, I, I didn't really, 
address and you know i'm afraid i'm going to run into a bunch of cartoonists who are like i still do stuff in that great style and you didn't i'm like i didn't know and that's the thing i just didn't know but like everything is out there in such insane abundance that like you know it's you know it's out there uh final thought you know if the the people in uh you know in dirty pictures were fighting against actual censorship where you know guys with guns would impound and put people in jail or you know impound copies and burn them and destroy them what is the nature of the equivalent kind of speech codes or censorship now? And is that as big a threat, do you think? I mean, you're a professional libertarian as well as a historian of, of you know, countercultural movements. You know, are we in a, uh, you know, is, is speech much freer now or is it just being corralled yeah, you know, in uh, different ways? No one's being arrested for it. But, you know, the, 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 the theme of the reason story I wrote that it, th this book is not like an expansion of it or anything, but like researching that story sort of showed me the shape of this story was about that. Like there has been a recent movement of, you know, the, it's become a very cliched phrase and it's annoying to have it leave your lips. But the, the cancel culture concept, right? And um, that's very real. And. And but it's not like no one's being arrested for it. It's just people are being told by other people we do not appreciate this work that you do, and we do not wish to talk about it, and we do not wish to honor it. And to and then sometimes it spreads to and anyone who disagrees with this, we also do not wish to promote or honor. I, I do not. I don't like that as a cultural force, um, and that's discussed a little bit in the book. But uh, it is a different level. Of, of problem than arrest. Like it, it's just, it's the push pull of culture. Like people do have the right to say and draw what they want. And other people do have the right to say, here is what we think about what you have seen and drawn. And it's the so push it's good. pull. I mean, it's, we're in a better it's, place. We're definitely in a better place for that. I, I, I think, I think it's a better world. The less people try to even censure as opposed to censor, but there are, People could have a legitimate point that I'm speaking of a perspective that does not understand the reasons why mm -hmm. it's important to loudly express your disapproval of certain things. And I would have to grant that that's true. You know, there's things about my gender and my race and et cetera that probably make me unable to really get, you know, mm -hmm. why a certain old crumb drawing is something that they would just really rather never see again. And uh, and I think the story I wrote in Reason uh, talks about that a little bit and I hope treats that viewpoint uh, respectfully, and even like Noah Van Skyver, this really wonderful uh, current cartoonist, uh, is quoted in the in the book, and he said more of this to me. But he's just like, "Look, I love this stuff," but he's like, "I would never ever try to say to anyone like you've got to love it too, or you the things you see in it that you hate aren't there, or you shouldn't be bothered by them." He's like, "You you need to feel and react to things the way you feel and react to them," and. That that's that that is the constant push pull of human culture, and it's a million percent better than anyone being arrested, of course. But the fact that a lot of these people lived through the time when people were arrested, I think, makes them more sensitive, whether rightly or wrongly, right. to being told you shouldn't have done what you did. It's like, oh, whatever, you know, like, people got arrested for this, so yeah, yeah. All right, well, we're going to leave it there. Uh, thank you, Brian Doherty, author most recently of Dirty Pictures. <laughs> I was, I was going to read the uh, the subtitle, but uh, I uh, I guess we're, we might been, be out of time. It would have been even longer if I had my way. So I uh, agree. Thank you. I agree. So thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, thank you all for coming out to this version of the Reason Speak Easy. Uh, we hope to see you again uh, in a month or so. And if I've made the book sound more yeah. interesting than you thought it was an hour ago and, and you want to buy one, let me know. There's still some over there. Yes. I'd be happy to sell so we've you. So we've got the room for about another six or seven minutes. So grab another drink, tip the bartenders very well, buy a couple of books. Uh, thank you all for coming out and we'll see you soon. Thank you.